You don't know your ass from a hole in the ground. Anybody who knew their ass from a hole in the ground could stand up and tell me how they know when something's real. It was certainly intense. I mean, the S training was, was real intense. It was an intense look at yourself. I want you to get that this is the way you live your life. You live your life as if reality is what's real to you. I thought he was just like direct and, and compassionate, like ruthless compassion. Old ladies don't bother me, you know that? I'm happy to you. That's good. I don't have any respect for old ladies. I got respect for people, but not old ladies. People had no idea what they were going to, what the course was going to do for them. None. And most people were very, very, very uptight. Don't go back into your act! God damn it, your life's about what you're hiding! Let go! When the S train began, there was nothing like it. There's now hundreds, thousands of workshops and seminars. For people who didn't know anything about it, it was scary. Well, what is this stuff? Is it a religion? Is it uh, brainwashing? They, they make you feel better or something? What is it? I don't know, he's a mixture of Aristotle, Frank Sinatra, and Gandhi. Tonight's guest is one of the great question marks of our time. A major influence in American life for two decades, now virtually out of sight in the 90s. His personal transformation training called EST and its successor, The Forum, helped define the 70s and 80s. It was all about seizing control of your life, taking responsibility. Millions swore by Earhart's technique. Then came a series of personal and professional attacks. Rather than respond, Earhart left the United States in 1991. Whatever happened to Werner Earhart? Things were exploding. Art was exploding. Music was exploding. It was the time of the creation of a counterculture. And San Francisco was ground zero for the counterculture. We have been born to find our way. What is the path that we will take? It was the most experiential time I can imagine. Everybody was into expanding themselves, trying to improve themselves, trying to get to the depth of them. There was um, primal scream was there, transactional analysis. And so then we said, well, why not a human potential movement? So we start talking about it, half jokingly. But pretty soon, in the temper of the times, it was taken up. And people said, yes, it's a human potential movement. After the war, there was a sort of a breakdown in organized religion, institutionalized religion. People started looking at spirituality and religion, self-help uh, groups as like a fee for service. You paid a set fee. So rather than throwing in $10 a week or $20 a week in the collection plate at the church, or, or a dollar in many cases, uh, you would pay a fixed fee, like $250 for a, for a weekend seminar. Well, the things that were famous in, in the kind of anti-establishment work, you know, like Esalen, where it was a big thing, you would go and there were co-ed, nude, mineral baths, and things like that, and uh, most middle-class people, were that's the last thing in the world they would do. But Werner Earhart was uh, a whole different scene. I mean, here's a guy, he didn't come on like a, a guru or a hippie. Here's a guy in a 
crisp white business shirt, no love beads. Uh, this was for uh, middle class people. Good morning. Good morning. Have a good training. Our first guest event for Est was October 1st in that Jack Tar Hotel. And, uh, you know, we didn't really know how many people would show up. If anybody would show up, we were pretty committed they would. But it was, it was full to the brim. People were shocked. They'd never been spoken to in a way where they were told flat out what the rules were. And then the trainer would come in from the back of the room in the middle of the ground rules and say, wake up, you assholes. <laughs> You're an asshole and your life doesn't work. Being centered is being able to tell the difference between your ass and a hole in the ground, that's all. It ain't no big deal. You're an asshole, Harry, because you can't tell the difference between your ass and a hole in the ground. What we do and what he did is to get people back to nothing. Where what is, is, and what isn't, isn't. There is no necessary relationship between the way you feel, the way you think, the way you are, the way you figured it out, and the way it really is. Well, I think that Werner Erhard was, was a real marketing genius. And a lot of his ideas, of course, it was a mixture of, of uh, Eastern mysticism, of his whole power of positive thinking. He just packaged it in a way that uh, was very appealing and very familiar to Americans. How profound is it if you know everything and your life doesn't work any better? How profound is it if you're down and hip and your life doesn't work any better? Werner benefited from, from, from dozens and dozens of very popular stories about you know, S being on the cutting edge of human transformation and everybody doing it. And you warn anybody if you hadn't done the S seminar. You know, S training became the thing to do amongst Hollywood people. And at that time, the chairman of the board of uh, Warner Brothers took part in the S training. And it got to be a joke, they used to call it Warner Brothers, because so many people from the Hollywood scene were taking part in the S training. You fill up my senses. John Denver did it, and Diana Ross, and Dr. Phil. You, you know, it kept going. I'll fight you. Well, I'll fight. <laughs> sure. Fist fight. Oh, Bare fist knuckles. fight. And wrestle. Okay, everything. Every... Fight, okay. scratch. All right. Thank you for loving Rhoda. And personal, um, personal thanks, uh, very private ones, to someone who's profoundly uh, influenced my life, uh, Werner Erhard. But it also went into the Harvard Business School, the Harvard School of Divinity. It went um, to the Dean of the Wharton School of Business. I mean, it went through all veins of humanity. Assholes! You're all assholes, every one of you. The media turned it into a parody of itself uh, without really talking about the facts of it. The facts of it were the training did go late um, every night, all four nights. Um, and, uh, and, uh, but, you know, th there's stuff in the paper you can read or, or in articles about the doors being locked. The doors were never locked. Um, and if you had to go to the bathroom, you could obviously go to the bathroom, but so you made an agreement to be in the room the entire time. And unlike and most things in life, part of what the training uh, both taught and demonstrated was integrity. Do what you say and uh, uh, say what you're going to do. Wait for the microphone. Why can't we go to the bathroom if we have to? Because you can't. See, I, I told you that the one thing we would guarantee is that you would find out that you were in a tube. You have been seven whole hours without having peeing run your life. You have transcended peeing. The intrusiveness came from a commitment to produce the result and then seeing what was necessary to produce the result. And in the early 70s, there was a, I don't know, a kind of uh, human potential fog uh, anything from the neck up was suspicious. So it took that kind of dramatic intrusiveness to get through all of that so that people could think for themselves and take a 
really honest look at their lives and themselves. What is EST? What's the essence of EST? Barbara, it's a course for people who are getting along in life successfully and who are willing to expand their experience of aliveness and satisfaction. If you came in here to get better, if you came in here to stroke yourself, if you came in here for all that nonsense, it's the wrong place to be. This is not about getting better. This is about completing your transformation. Where is it, head, torso, or hips? I think it's your head. I was in Los Angeles where I was teaching acting and directing things and actors told me about this thing called the S training which sounded to me like some kind of pop psychology boot camp and the more I heard about it the less I wanted to do it. It just sounded, you know, it sounded like they locked you in a room and screamed. I heard all that stuff but I guess people heard, you know, that you were locked in a room and people shouted at you and you couldn't go to the bathroom. Within 10 minutes it was the most extraordinary educational experience I'd ever had of learning. I learned more about life and myself in that two weekends and it, it, it really rocked me. Why do you have to be a nice guy? Why do you have to look hip? Why do you have to look cool? Why do you have to come off as smart? Why do you have to come off as attractive? Why do you have to keep it all together? Why does it always have to look good? What is it that looking good hides? People got a chance to turn around so fast that they actually saw themselves as other people see them. And, you know, the first shot you get of that is you don't like what you see. But people who come really to see themselves deeply are moved to tears by who they are. And you can only, only get to that place where you can see yourself if you're willing to take a look at that first glance, which is really a tough one, to see your own weaknesses and your own lack of generosity and your own self-concern and selfishness and so forth. I saw what my life up to that point had been about was doing everything my way, no matter what the real rules of the game were, trying to get away with things and trying to impress people, wanting to somehow impress people. and I. Somehow, get, I don't remember exactly what I thought, but I know that somewhere in there I realized that I would never impress people enough to compensate for whatever I was trying to compensate mm -hmm. for by impressing people, and it stopped being interesting. Then there's the second part of the process where everybody lay on the floor, and you did a, uh, you a you're asked to completely relax, and then you're asked to pretend that you were frightened of the person lying next to you. And then you expanded that and expanded that and expanded And then they were encouraged to let it all out. If you're under pressure under something all your life, you don't feel it. You know, there are these fish that live at the bottom of the sea, 10,000 feet, and they pull them right up from the bottom and explode. But they don't know the pressure because they're down in it. They've been in, they're born into it and live into it. Human beings live inside that kind of a pressure. And when that's gone, experiences you've been let out of jail and you didn't even know you were in jail. It was a great, great, great exercise. You are scared to death! Let yourself complete! I saw people cry, I saw people faint, I saw people scream, I saw a lot of levels of emotion and it showed me that I wasn't alone in some of the things that I've been feeling in my life. I wasn't the only one, uh, and remember I was very young, I was 19 who was feeling like there was no point to any of this. And that gave me a lot of strength. The transformation that people experienced in the programs was a freedom from the self that limited them so that they had an opportunity for true self-expression. You know, we all live inside of limits that built up over the years, some of which we put there, some of which were put there by others. But what happened for people in their transformation in the programs was they got free of that self that kind of just growed. I'm just the opposite of many. She said she feels superior, I yeah. feel inferior. So look, so you've got a way of looking at the world a filter, like a position, 
See, you've taken the position, I'm inferior. Some place in your life, something threatened you. And, at, and in that moment of being threatened and perhaps a little unconscious, you know, if somebody smacks you in the face like that, you kind of lose your awareness a little bit. You made a decision that you were inferior, but I want you to know what the decision was for. It was useful at the moment as a way of dealing with the threat, and you turned it into an id. This is how people destroy their lives. They turn words into things. I took the S training in 1975, and frankly, it annoyed me that people were talking about something you could do in four days that would, you know, that had, was taking me a lot longer. So I dismissed it. In the training, I realized that I had virtually cut my parents out of my life, and I reestablished my relationship with my parents, and I experienced loving my parents profoundly again. Like I, like I began to love my mother, like I had loved her when I was a little girl. Look, Cynthia, your relationship with your father is about your goddamn survival. And you organize the relationship so as to survive, so as to make your father wrong and you right. right. For instance, you avoid being like your father. Even where knocking somebody over might be appropriate, you won't do it. Because you aren't going to be like your father. Your father's wrong. And what it costs you, you know, all racketeers pay under the table. They get paid under the table and they pay. What it costs you is love, happiness, health, and self-expression. Primarily love. It doesn't take two weekends to become transformed. It takes an instant, and it, and it never happens in a period longer than an instant. So there's a process one goes through, which you could say is down, 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 and then suddenly open. It's not worth my life to live inside of protecting myself and defending myself from people hurting me. It was a breakthrough into like a whole new way of thinking. Carrying your dead father's body around for three years stinks. <laughs> a life lived out of the past is going to be a life in which you're going through the motions. You can do it better than you did it in the past, you can do more or less, you can do more of the good stuff, less of the bad stuff than you did in the past, and you can even try to do it differently. But it's all derived from the past. If I'm gonna do something different, it's gonna be different than it was in the past, so it's still somehow connected to the past. I'm still trying to overcome the past. And it's possible to complete the past in a way that allows you to create a future that gives you a life that's more powerful, more self-expressive, and more full of satisfaction. When I was 20 years old, I walked into the arc of a turning airplane propeller when I was in flight training, which caught me in the left side of my face and severed all the muscles on my left shoulder. And it ended what was going to be my career, which was to become a pilot. And underneath it, I was always disappointed that I didn't get to have my dream because I had been dreaming of being a pilot since I was a child. And I was, had been divorced, I had been married for four years. I married when I was 20 years old, and I think I divorced when I was 24. And my whole view of women, my view of my former marriage, was they were all to blame. At the end of the S training, all the blame was gone. I wasn't blaming myself, I wasn't blaming the other pilot, I wasn't bl blaming my former wife. I really was able to see everything in the perspective, okay, that's what happened. Literally, like, what is, is, and what is, and isn't. And it was the experience of having a past completely disappear, and then I was free to go forward into a new future. It changed my life totally. This lady lives her life as if 
When she feels a bear, there's really a bear. Now, 10 minutes ago, I said, you didn't know the difference between your ass and a hole in the ground. You said, oh, yes, I do. <laughs> and yet, here's this beautiful lady standing up, letting it all hang out. And she's saying, if I feel a bear, there's a bear there, really. We don't, have to, we don't give a shit what they think. When you really feel a bear, you really feel a bear. Right. Yes. It may not necessarily be true. It may not necessarily be real. Real. But it's... See, but you really feel it, don't right. you? Right. So there are things called I really feel, and then there are things called really there. Your feelings, real or not, aren't related to the rest of reality in any way necessarily. No one would admit that their reality is based on their feelings. That they would say, no, 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 I, uh, I don't believe it till I see it. Many people live their lives as though what they felt is so is real. My father didn't love me. People don't listen to me, or I can't get my ideas across, or you can't trust people. It, it's something with which one is stuck rather than something that one has some choice about. One of the most powerful lessons I took from the training was realizing that the notion that things are some way can be an incredible limitation on your ability to discover something outside the box. If you're convinced that the box is real and that you're in it, there isn't much you can do. But if you realize the box is a construct and you don't have to be in it, then all kinds of possibilities open. And for me, what opened were new ways of looking at old problems uh, that suggested that if I was going down a blind alley, I might as well try something radically different rather than persisting going down the same blind alley I've been going down before. In April 1968, his convictions have led him fearlessly to Memphis, Tennessee. 1968, I checked out. Assassination of King. I severed and cut my relationship with white people. What I got out of the S training was a ship actually excluding white people out of my life to including them in my life. So what I got personally out of it was an experience of peace. When you view what's out there, it looks like people who, are res who resist are assholes. No, it, it, it appears to me as though that's what you're saying. Yes, from your point of view, it appears that that's what I'm saying. But that's a function of your point of view. Yes, definitely. Terrific. As long as you know that you have put a point of view together, that enables you to hear something which I'm not saying, something which is... No, no, of course you're not saying it, but it's clearly implied from what that, what's up on the board. <laughs> no. Frank, it's only clearly implied from your point of view. Yes, exactly. It, yes, but then wait. So, so, now look, my friend, you are the guy creating that notion, not me. Warner's ability to ask incisive questions, to really get at the heart of the matter and to understand everything. This man, I realized, was very, very smart. He had no particular formal training in anything, but he understood things as well as anyone I'd ever seen. And I've been around a lot of smart people in academia. This is an extraordinary intellect I saw at work here and a difficult personality. Um, when I was a little girl, my parents put me in an orphanage several times. And Isn't that beautiful? Now, if you were going to write a movie, is that a good start? <laughs> Now, there's not a person in the room who ain't awake listening to Charlotte's story. And Charlotte put this story together with great care. Pay attention. We admire the fact that he's making people more responsible and quit whining and blaming other people. That's all to the good. But when he says that if you're walking along a street and from a skyscraper, a big plate glass window comes down, falls, and cuts you in half and kills you, you chose that. You made that happen. I said, get off. Just don't, don't, don't use that anymore. Your parents put you in an orphanage because they love you. Now, we leave them out of it. Now, now let's find out why you put yourself in an orphanage. You put yourself in an orphanage because orphan was the best racket you could figure out. You could not figure out a better racket. Now, what was the payoff? What do you get out of being an orphan? I get to be better than anybody in the world. You bet your ass. Orphan is the best position you can be in. 
But not only that, you don't have to say that to anybody. They think that they're better than an orphan, but we know. We know the beauty and tragedy and power of being an orphan. Pay off one. I received many complaints from people who went through the seminar training and felt uh, that they were being re-victimized in situations where they were in fact victims. For example, uh, women that were sexually harassed or abused, um, men who had been treated badly by a father, um, people who had suffered in some way and through, and through the seminar were being told, don't uh, posture as a victim, uh, take responsibility. Well, many people are in fact victimized by others. And to do this, that is to victim bash someone in the context of, of a seminar can be uh, a very, uh, very overwhelming and negative experience. The little angel orphan is vindicated and the big monster parents have now been found. Do you want, I'm not making fun of you, by the way. I want, I want you to see. Yeah, I, I, see, I, you're, you're standing there crying about this story. And you're stuck crying about the goddamn story because you're lying about I'm it. not crying about the story. I'm crying because when I walked out of this fucking room, I felt like filth. Yeah, that's exactly where you're at. Obviously, people get victimized. And uh, there are people who, who victimize people. And, but that's not what responsibility was about. Responsibility was about a way of empowering yourself with the things that you need to deal with in life. And uh, if, if uh, what I need to deal with is having been victimized, all the more need for some power to deal with something in a place where I've been victimized. It hurts. No, it doesn't hurt. You make it hurt. Look, I just said the whole goddamn thing. It didn't hurt me a bit. You make it hurt. What's the payoff for being hurt? People to care. So you gotta give up pretending you don't want that. Now, so that Charlotte's time up there is not contributed in vain. You gotta give up pretending you don't want that. You want it. Wars and exterminated peoples, too much for you to confront. We won't handle that this time. Confront your own goddamn scenario, your own goddamn uh, soap opera. You want it. Life doesn't have any satisfaction, and you've tried everything, and nothing works, and you're just desperate to make it work, and you, you're shit. That's the way it's got to be for you to survive. Yes, I am ruthless. I'm ruthless in the sense that I see no need for people to suffer. I see no need for people to live a life if, if only, or I could have been or for somebody to be on their deathbed and realize that they had something to give, they had something to contribute, they had something of themselves to express that never got expressed. I'm ruthless, ruthlessly against that, ruthlessly for people having all of it. What? You've always bought all that victim shit. Oh, yeah. Sure, because that fit right into your case. You, she loved well, Harry. You listen, rich. I mean, I'm not going to buy it anymore if it... <laughs> It. It's, it's the only cost of your life, Charlotte. <laughs> hey, kid, you're stuck in bad stories. Yeah. But they're only stories, Charlotte. Are you an orphan? No. No, not really. I have seen him, as many people have, as, a, as work with people one-on-one, -on -one, where I have seen people really released from things that were holding them back. But his way of doing it was not comfortable. It was not uh, soothing, oh, there, there, you'll be better. And a lot of people were upset by that. You're actually kind of dead, sweetheart. 
Now, you're not a bad-looking corpse. <laughs> but that's really fooling, to be a not a bad-looking corpse. If you're not a bad-looking corpse, then you're still dead. You're dead like being, like a person. And you're taking good care of the corpse. So you're kind of traffic on being all right with people. being attractive to people. Is that clear what I'm saying? Yeah. I, I you guess can I don't get... get by get... without getting any place. Yeah. I can just get by all the time. Yeah, and you do get by. Yeah. Warner would be the first to admit that he's learned a lot from other people. He has debts to other thinkers, to various religious traditions. Warner Earhart, like a number of other uh, important thinkers, and I think Warner's a very powerful thinker, uh, an authentic American genius, if you will, has drawn on a vast array of traditions and thinkers to put together his approach to transformation, if you will. This is not unusual among famous uh, European and American intellectuals. Heidegger, for example, Martin Heidegger, the philosopher, someone I teach a lot, was influenced by Plato, Aristotle, Kant, Kierkegaard, Nietzsche, and, and a host of other thinkers. So Werner, I think, has to be conceived in that way. He's a kind of artist, a thinker, an inventor, who has big debts to others, who borrowed from, from others, but then put the whole thing together in a way no one else had ever done. The way Est happened was very simple. I had this transformational experience. I had a transformation. Whoever I had been, up until that point, I no longer was. And I was on my way to work, and I happened to be, not anything significant about being on the Golden Gate Bridge, but I happened to be there. Uh, and that's when I had the realization that what my life was about was really meaningless. It was empty. And this realization that the things that I thought were so significant, like looking good and winning, just the normal things that, that I guess most people think are important, that they really had no importance, that it was all empty and meaningless. When I broke through the sadness, broke through the sense of despair at having wasted my life, I all of a sudden realized, my God, I'm free. What? Free? What's that mean to be free? Free to choose, free to create a life that was worth living. So I took a day with my staff, shared with them the best I could, something that would allow them to create for themselves the kind of transformational experience that I had had. And we all decided, okay, we'll do this. Instead of uh, selling books, we'll do this. This is called the Franklin House, and it's on Franklin Street in the, in the uh, residential area of San Francisco. And Werner's office was at the very, very, very top, up in the, the attic, up there at the top of the cupola, not where the large windows are. And the lower floors were bedrooms and also uh, uh, a living room and, and a really, really great dining room where he, uh, had, where he hosted salons for people of... Uh, intellectuals of all walks. It was just an amazing group of people that got together at these different dinners that he had. Play yourself off against that intention. The experience was being in the presence of a laser beam. Very focused, always on purpose. So the Einstein quote was what was up there. Yes. Good. Warner, go. I don't know, I think we had something like 600,000 people did the S training. And at one time, at one time, there were 10,000 people on the rolls waiting to get into their course. Well, families would be upset that a loved one became so immersed uh, in Est and so submerged within a kind of subculture that existed around it that this would be um, a cause of family estrangement in some situations, couples would divorce, um, and friendships would lapse, simply because people were either critical or, in many cases, not interested. 
those of us who went through the training in the early days, we did create a, a culture of being obsessed by something and uh, almost like a fanatic uh, response to having everyone have this experience. I mean, the nice way of putting it was that they were over-exuberant. The realistic way of it was that they were obnoxious, that they were relentless, that they were unreasonable, and they never, ever could take no for an answer. Hi, Jim. I'd like a hug. Thank you. <laughs> I think it got viewed as a sign of a movement or a cult because Werner was the central figure. You know, you know what makes news in the media is controversy, so a lot of controversy was built up around him. He, he, he loved the attention, he loved the publicity, it was all about that. You know, it's true, the media does that. They build people up and they knock them down. That's what we do, you know, and it's not one of the better things that we do. Other detractors say S charges $250 a weekend. Now that time, 65,000 graduates comes to something like $16 million. Mm. And people say, look, if I were paying $60 an hour to a psychiatrist, it wouldn't bother me. But somehow this does. Most of the S workers are volunteers, and people feel that you're absolutely cleaning up, and they want to know where this money goes. It's not enough that the training transformed the quality of your life. It's not enough to, for you to know that you weren't conned. If anybody thinks you were conned, that shoves you into the closet, into the woodwork. One of the reasons that he was attacked so heavily was that he was, as I say, he was the first of these guys like, say, Deepak Chopra or the many, many seminars that, that go on now who charge money. And so they said, wait a minute, what are you doing charging? You say you want to help people uh, improve themselves or get better or have greater access to something but you're charging money now isn't that wrong there was a lot of very critical uh, commentary about s in the literature people like uh, kurt back had talked about it as a very narcissistic indulgent kind of training um, so i decided to do this study what does it mean to make a difference in the world well most people think it means to leave behind a city which has your name on it, or some great organization. What makes a difference is to make a difference in people's lives. There were approaching 75,000 people who'd been through the S training, and they were like I, w I was, <laughs> completely uh, overwhelmed with their own transformation um, in a kind of vitality and longing to serve and make a difference with their life that was uh, just bubbling up and, and kind of coming out of their pores. We don't allow ourselves to think that the world could work for all of us. That's a radical kind of thinking. The surprising finding was that the graduates of EST were much more concerned with the welfare of other human beings. Here was a group of people that uh, basically were being maligned by the media for being narcissistic, self-indulgent, self-centered, egoistic, and it turns out that they weren't. In the early days of the Hunger Project, Werner um, generated this very powerful conversation which was to make the end of hunger an idea whose time has come. There were all kinds of controversies over, you know, let them eat words, um, was one article I remember. Uh, because the Hunger Project didn't directly feed people. The Hunger Project catalyzed um, in education and action, and education for action. And uh, we just plotted through it because um, we, those of us who were on the front lines and who were managing the finances and the educational programs, knew that it was clean. The $100 million we collected over many years and still going, but that money is spent to empower people living in places where hunger persists, resource poor people, to get access to that which they need. Uh, that will make them able to be self-reliant and self-sufficient. In some cases, it's microcredit for women in a village. In some cases, it's, it's literacy programs. In Africa, the Hunger Project has ending hunger epicenters where people come to learn about better farming techniques, to become literate, to get access to credit, to understand that they're the source of the end of hunger. Hundreds of thousands of people 
have made a difference in their lives and a difference in the world through the work of Werner Earhart. I mean, big differences in business, diplomacy, the arts, government, charitable organizations, you name it. But Werner has been crucified in the media. First, his programs were attacked, and then it got personal. Werner Earhart is the author of the controversial program. Part of the controversy is Earhart himself. He was a salesman and a management training executive, among other things, before he went into the philosophy business. He deserted his first wife and four children in 1960 and changed his name from Jack Rosenberg to Werner Earhart. So I was a very successful liar for most of my life, so I know a lot about lying. The point when I realized I was getting away with it, I also realized that everybody knew. He said, you know, I think you think I'm Warner Earhart, don't you? I said, yeah. <laughs> he said, my name's really Jack Rosenberg. And I knew he meant it. And he said, you know, that he'd had, had another family Certainly, I was shocked. He was just a pleasure for me all the way from the time he was born. That was my whole life at that time. You know, one child. Joe and I uh, rarely met. He worked nights, and I worked daytime. When Werner came, that was it. I was very happy and contented to be married and have my child. When I found out that Pat was pregnant, I said, well, you have to marry her. Now, the priest at my church said, Dorothy, no, he does not have to marry her. I said, I say he does. Here's an 18-year-old father. That was his... My ambition for him was that he, was go, he would go the limit as far as education. That was the end of his, uh, his high school. But when his children came along, I know he was upset. And when he left, he said, I'm not gonna be Joe Lunchpail lunch for the rest of my life. I heard him say that. I didn't think he was going to leave, but, you know, he was gone 13 years. Uh, you know, I had four children with Pat. I believe that what I had done with my life had led me into a dead end. And I was becoming more and more and more aware that there was something other than that dead end. In leaving, I recognized that I was a horrendous failure, that I had wound up as a horrendous failure. You can't fail, I, I, I can't think of any lower way of failing than the way I failed, which was to desert my family. And, um, and that was the sense I had when I left. I had failed. I literally remember my mother wailing at night and uh, in, in pain like somebody had stuck a knife in her. Uh, and I know my mother just, uh, you know, my brother was an only child for 13 years and, uh, and my father was gone for probably, I don't know, five or six of those 13 years between World War II and, uh, and college. And so, uh, you know, my mother and my, and my oldest brother were very, very close. And, uh, and when he left, it just ripped a hole in her heart. I drank constantly, constantly, just so it wouldn't have any feelings. You know, a great deal of whatever value I might be comes from my mother. And to have caused my mother that kind of suffering, that kind of pain, that kind of agony, was really brutal for me when I found out about it. You know, 
I, I certainly must have understood that it would be a problem for her, but not the kind of problem that it wound up being for her. And that was, you know, I sowed, so I had to reap. Hi, Mother. Hi. Hi, sweetheart. I'm Still. waiting all morning for you. <laughs> How you doing? How are you? <laughs> I'm good. You know, I'm a good example of anything can be made right. Um, you know, I can't take back the suffering, but I could build something truly wonderful on after the suffering. I remember we went to Dorothy's house, my grandmother, and uh, he was stiff. Sorry, he was standing at the door. And we all walked in one by one, and he greeted us and said our name. And um, it was like he had never left. Certainly, if I couldn't take responsibility for the difficulties that I've had in my life, I would say that, you know, you'd have to wind up questioning the validity of the ideas that I shared with other people. If I wasn't gonna live by those ideas myself, I, I, I should be questioned, and the ideas should be questioned. But, uh, you know, I used the things that I had developed over the years, the thinking to develop, to, to deal with what was really a very difficult situation. That's when your grandfather was a young man, so you know, know that's your grandfather, yeah. Mommy, who did this? Well, and it's interesting because I used to think, geez, if my father had never come back, where would I be today? And I'm 100% certain that my life would not at all look like what it does today. I live my life with certainty now and a level of integrity that didn't exist before. You know, the one thing I don't know, if he had been my son or had been my husband, would I ever have had the courage or bigness or magnanimity to forgive him? And I saw them do that. And that's what I was left with. What makes news is what's bad. What makes news is what's wrong. What makes news is what's controversial. So they would report about his having left his family back in Philadelphia when he was a young man and deserted them, but wouldn't report about that he healed the family, he went back and he, and he asked for forgiveness from them, completely healed the family. The family then moved out to San Francisco. These kids were living out in, this, in the Bay Area. None of that, that didn't get made a big, into a big report. What made news was the bad stuff. The 60 Minutes program that finally aired on March 3rd, 1991, what it basically did was took a lot of the allegations that had already been out there in the press about Warner, which was that he was, he was a maniac, you know, a greedy, power-hungry guru type person that wanted a cult, that he was building a cult. But it took it a little bit further, so that he was an abusive employer and an abusive father and an abusive spouse to his wife, his ex-wife by then. But even further than that, it had some allegations of, of rape that he had raped one of his daughters. That was the, the basic of the program. That's what put it over the top. The first thing that happened is I asked Werner whether it was true. And he said, no, it wasn't. The second thing was, and I don't remember who suggested it, if it was he who suggested it or me, was to get, to have a lie detector test. I thought that that would make a difference to the producers of the program and the station which was on which they were producing it. So I spoke to them, both of them, and I said, this is what we did. Now, I'm not expecting that you're going to accept our polygraphist. My offer to you is I will give you our report. You go out and find your own expert to take a lie detector test, anybody you want, anywhere you want, and Mr. Earhart will come wherever you ask him to come, and he will answer all of the questions that he has asked. Then, if you find that your polygraph results 
are the same as ours, consistent. And you're satisfied that he's telling the truth. Will you agree not to publish the kind of story that could ruin a man's reputation, ruin a man's career, could ruin a man's life? They didn't respond. The charges of molestation by his daughters have been reported uh, in a number of publications, including the London Times and the Boston Globe, to have been recanted or disproved. One of his daughters was offered uh, a large sum of money by a writer who said he would share, give her this money out of a book deal if she would lie about her father, and she sued the writer. You can't say a worse thing about a father. And uh, it was just very, very, very clear for me that my family was broken and that I had to be responsible for the family being broken again. Uh, this time it was broken while it was around, not broken in my leaving. Shortly before that 60 Minutes piece came out, uh, Werner said, my reputation will be destroyed when this piece comes out because if I go on the show to defend myself, I'm going to have to be in the position of attacking my own daughter, which I'm unwilling to do. And they're not going to, hit, they're not going to deal with this fairly and it's going to destroy my reputation. So he said, that's it. Werner left the United States in February of 91 just before a critical 60-minute segment was to air. Why did you, why did you go and why aren't you back? Well, Larry, I've chosen not to come to the United States at this time uh, because uh, being in the U.S., I'm just too easy a target for the campaign of harassment uh, being waged against me by the Church of Scientology. L. Ron Hubbard was mad at Warner from the very beginning because Warner took some Scientology courses, back when he was taking all kinds of courses, and he was putting together his own field, his own uh, programs. And this, this, sci this LA Times story talked about sort of the, the history of that and how, why that would have upset Hubbard so much. He just, he thought that Warner had stolen his technology. I don't know if he really thought that, but that's what he said. And that this was, this was somebody that needed to be put out of business. So 60 Minutes was getting a lot of, not all from Scientology, but they were certain get, certainly getting fed a lot of information from the private investigators that were behind the scenes gathering all this information. Warner was declared an enemy way back in the early 70s when he first started S by L. Ron Hubbard, who called him fair game, I think is, is the word for it. And I've seen the document for that, where he was declared fair game. I've never seen a public figure treated so unfairly as Werner Earhart. When he left the country after the 60 Minutes uh, piece, he was widely accused of evading taxes. So that's why he's fleeing the IRS. So he uh, sued the IRS uh, for false, falsely representing that. He won the suit, was awarded $200,000, and only one newspaper printed that, about that award, was the Los Angeles Daily News. I don't think the media by itself destroyed Warner unfairly. I think Warner had a lot to do with it. I think he, because of his, his stance early on by avoiding granting interviews and not paying much attention to how he presented the work, you know, it's kind of, it, it kind of got that guru thinking mentality out there. And he did a lot of things that that people were interested in, you know, leaving his family. But I think that the media was unfair in that that was all it looked at. It was not taking in the, the whole picture, the humanitarian awards, the hunger project, all the, the, the work that Warner did that benefited so many people. You didn't read much about that. That's not very juicy news. I think the reason that there was controversy was not just because it was Werner Earhart, but rather because of the nature of the programs. When you put yourself out as this philosophical guru, people expect you to practice what you preach. If 
my reputation is destroyed, public reputation is destroyed, the question is, can I be who I am with no reputation? And I can be, and so could anybody else. And if the rules of the game is, look, you get to play the game with no reputation, then you get to play the game with no reputation. Now, play. When he left the country, he sold, he gave, essentially gave the business to uh, the employees of, and he, um, he took on the debts. As a matter of fact, he's mentioned to me in the past that when he first left the country and was in Japan, that it was like kind of the first time in many years that he had to look at the right-hand side of the menu before ordering. A lot of people weren't to probably think 14 years ago you ran away to an exotic island just like this. <laughs> what, what, have, what have you really been up to for the past 14 years? Really, for the most part, the same things that I'd been up to before, doing programs for people in various places around the world, doing consulting with various companies and other kinds of organizations around the world, trying to go to places where there's um, long-term suffering and uh, see if there's some way I can make a contribution, some way I can enable people to make a difference for themselves. You have got Catholic nationalists who want to see Ireland united and Protestant unionists who wish to see Northern Ireland, the six counties of Northern Ireland, remain part of the United Kingdom. Now, that is the basis upon which all, almost all commentary on the uh, troubles and all projects for solving the troubles is based. Some of the people who were victims in that atrocity, or whose family members were victims, they are survivors of it, are um, held continually in the limelight. Um, as almost professional victims. Mm. They're almost being forced to be professional victims. I would start with my own kind of taking a look at what might be the payoff for keeping this conversation about the, her being a victim, keeping that alive. What's the payoff for me as a community member for keeping that conversation alive? And then what's the cost to me as a community member for keeping that conversation alive. One of the things I was asked to do in Northern Ireland was to work with a nonprofit organization that worked with uh, uh, professionals in the peace and reconciliation area and community leaders who were trying to do something to resolve the conflicts in Northern Ireland. I'm pretty certain that when people get stuck in grief or uh, as victims, that what keeps them stuck is the significance, not what happened. You know, that's a terrible thing to say to somebody who's been victimized or somebody who's lost someone close to them. But I'm sorry. I know that that's where I've got to get ultimately. What we're, we were able to support these community leaders and professionals in doing was working with people in a community to be able to get past the history they were stuck with and be able to create a future for themselves that wasn't limited by the history with which they were stuck. From their reports about the breakthroughs that they've been able to create in their own communities or the people they work with, I believe that the day will come when there won't be that kind of conflict in Northern Ireland. Do you have the same problems around the world that you would in the States? Like, do you have to look over your shoulder and see who's, who, are there any, no, Generally is there speaking, uh, I have had no uh, enemies tracking me around the world. Uh, as long as I uh, stay out of the United States and I keep a relatively low profile. So it is sad and you have 
this feeling being sad. But you think you're sad. Well, most of us in the West think that the Japanese are very staid and very unemotional. The truth of the matter is that the Japanese in the right kind of setting are as emotional as people in the West. So I want you to push against me. And keep doing it. Yeah, keep doing it. Can you see that you're trapped? You see that I own you? You see that you got no freedom? That I got your whole life locked in? Yeah, that's your husband. He owns your life. What I was demonstrating when I was asking the woman to push on me is for her to see that whatever you're resisting, whatever you, you're pushing against, you're stuck and, to. And so when she was pushing against me, she could see that she kind of was stuck against me. And when she could let me be, that let her be. And then she had some power to relate to me, relate to her husband, relate to her son who was in prison uh, in a way that she could make a contribution for them. Yeah, what's sad is throwing your life away. That's sad. That's really sad. Yeah, throwing away joy. Throwing away vitality. Throwing away love. Throwing away your own self-expression. Yeah, being owned by bullshit. Yeah, in the year 2000, uh, as you may recall, there was uh, the Barack government's attempt to do a peace deal with the Palestinians. And as part of the peace process, many hundreds of Israelis and uh, others went and made, built bridges with the Palestinians. Uh, my job was to train them in American management thinking, and I used the technology for this assignment of Werner Earhart, his ideas and thinking, because it was a very tense situation. You're down there all alone at a Gaza military strip by yourself, and you have a highly critical audience. Uh, their first uh, opening statement to me is, why should they listen? I was uh, an American Zionist with uh, Palestinian blood on my hands. You know, with that kind of audience, you want the most power you can uh, have to deliver to the, to the group because they're gonna be highly critical, to say the least. Other soldiers or members of Fatah or members of the Palestinian Authority that you have fought with you have uh, perhaps struggled with where there's a very deep background of relatedness where if you were to work with those men you know that together you can accomplish many things the key however now is how do i create as strong a background with people where we may not be in a battle together but we have equally as important work the first key is to know what is, to know, to see, to know, to hear, what is the background of relatedness with the people I am engaged with. If it is a weak background of being related, your project has a weak foundation. We have very little in common on the surface. So, to work with you, I have to look for what is your concern, what are you committed to, and what's possible for us. When you can leave people with a way to communicate powerfully enough so that they can accomplish with communication what they might think they could only accomplish with violence, you really made a difference. We've gotten better and better and better and better and better and better at making weapons. We haven't gotten very much better at having love in our lives. We haven't gotten very much better at having a life full of joy. We haven't even gotten very much better at self-expression. Because I don't think the answer is in getting better. I think the answer is in creating a new context for being human, a new paradigm of being human. I've seen people transform their lives transform who they are, become a different kind of human being than the kind of human being they wound up being from their genes and from their upbringing. So I know it's possible. And 
and I'm committed that uh, that it could happen for everybody. I think a number of people feel that Est was a fad of the 70s and that's uh, gone by the wayside. I think they'd be surprised to learn how present uh, Werner's work is in the culture today. Thank you for sharing. Getting off it. Hey, come on, when are you going to get off it? These phrases, their terminology, their what used to be dismissed as their jargon is now part of the language. If you took six words like empower, commitment, making a difference, yeah, they've always been around, but they didn't suddenly become in everybody's ad, in everybody's company. I was just at Starbucks and there was a thing uh, saying work for Starbucks so you can make a difference in people's day. All that making a difference began in the S training. I moved from Colorado to Florida to be with him and gave up my way of life. What happened was between the time that I met him and moved, he cheated on me. On one hand, if you don't get it complete, you can never see clearly whether you can love him again. Whatever value there was had to stop being associated with my personality. Landmark, that was the company that was started by the people who were my employees in 1991, you know, are doing a brilliant job uh, making available the work that I started. Say, so listen, I want to start an open relationship with you. <laughs> I want to start brand new, but let me tell you some things. If at any point you do or say anything that reminds me of this, you two are out of here. By the way, haven't you noticed your beds are fairly crowded? Even though there's only two bodies in there, there's a whole bunch of people in there, right? Some of you even got your parents. I'd say, hey, you want to <laughs> meet my mom? You might like her. I, by the way, have no management position and no... Uh, ownership position. Uh, I, from time to time, they'll ask me, do I have a suggestion about this or that? So I consult with them whenever they ask, but I, uh, I have nothing to do with the company and the way it's run. What's killing off aliveness in the present isn't what happened. It's your story. Yeah. Now, the problem is you know that, yes? Yeah. But if you were to give it up for what's possible, you'd also have to give up your righteousness about it. Because it's part of the... It's part of the story. Yeah, you yeah. have to give up your justifying things in it. You'd have to give up your um, vilifying of dad in it, because that's part of it. You'd have to give up the unfairness of it, because that's part of it. You'd have to give up it should have been some other way. Or you got, you got to give it up. Warner stuff, I, I don't know any nice way to say it, is just out there in the world. You can't do a master's degree in organizational development or human resources without picking up some of it. And it's usually not credited back to him. But his stuff is just out there. Well, hi, this is Warren Bennis. I'm about it's the restoration of the self. That's what Warren is interested in. And I don't give one damn about whether that's attributed to Warner or not, or not attributed to Warner. It's what Warner's contribution is, the technology that takes an abstraction and changes people's lives. The CEO of BHP New Zealand Steel was at home. Someone drove by his house and shot at it, I think with a shotgun. Now, thankfully, the CEO wasn't home at the time. The head of the union later said that he didn't know who did it, but he wasn't sorry that it happened. Now, that was a set of relationships before people went into the program. When people came out, they began looking at each other as being their partners at work. So whether someone was in management or the union, didn't make a difference. They were all in partnership oriented around the success of the company. That almost never happens. Injury rates fell by something like 50%. Profitability went up by something like 30%. Uh, something called return on net assets, which is a metric of, of business success, went way up. So by any measurable standards, this company suddenly did very, very, very well. People end up 
collecting around one side of the table, shoulder to shoulder, looking at a set of issues and actively collaborating and figuring out how to solve it, solve those issues, resolve those problems in a way that makes everybody better off. It's been a puzzle to me uh, and a personal challenge to see that these ideas become part of every business uh, education program in the country. Up until the 80s, business worked off of a more or less military model of command and control. And what Fortune magazine was acknowledging was what we had brought into the business community, namely empowerment. So rather than simply managing people, there was now this new technology of empowering people at work. Landmark worked with uh, myself and Reebok during the early 1990s, 93 and 94. Uh, it was an incredible experience, one for both our employees uh, that got great value out of it individually. It changed their lives both at home and in work, which made the business significantly different. There are thousands of consulting firms that come out of that work. There are hundreds of not-for-profits. It's staggering the difference that that has made in this world. People put him on a pedestal, and whenever you put someone on a pedestal, they can only fall off. 1983, Warner founded the Breakthrough Foundation. The Breakthrough Foundation's sole purpose was to empower community members, giving people the opportunity to create their own answers. <laughs> Two decades later, the Youth at Risk program continued. I made up a story that my father wasn't good enough for me. You know, I, he left me because I wasn't good enough. So. I felt negative, you know, I wasn't good enough for anybody. Werner's whole message was the importance of the human being experiencing making a difference. So even with the gang members, it wasn't to arrest gangs, period. It was to have the gang members make a difference in their community. And on the way there, I remember one of the young people said, before I did this program, I didn't know I mattered. When I realized that I said I wanted to be in that program, I wanted to find my father, you know what I mean? We realized that I said this, so I can do this. I see possibility. I see able to create anything, something new. And to accept this award on his behalf are his daughters, Deborah and Anita Lynn. It is really our pleasure to be with you this evening and to honor and acknowledge our father. I don't think Werner gets any credit for the work he's done. It's, it's, let's disappear his name. Leave no traces. Make sure you're working with an eraser, a pencil that has an eraser. Serious thinkers have concluded that it is time for a new human being. So this is an invitation to be that new human being people saying he's not who he pretends to be and that I was a fraud, that I was a charlatan. I think that there's a, this thing in the media to hammer down the high nails or to cut off the high growth. People are only in it for the money, very rarely succeed. If what you're promising is a higher quality of life and being more effective in the places in life where you find yourself less effective, you know, the fact that it's still here after 33 years, and not only is it still here, but it's bigger than ever. The tragedy for me is that the, the media not being balanced, uh, and the media focusing on me like that made any difference. It wasn't me who made a difference, it was the ideas that made a difference, and that people were turned away because of the way things were portrayed in the media, uh, turned away from, from looking at the opportunity for themselves and making up their own minds, rather than having some person writing a story uh, making up their minds for them. But that's kind of, that's a shame. I think you, you couldn't have a, a better, uh, more meaningful legacy than to have been one of those people who created a work that helped people come awake. I think what 
is left, which is what he once left, which are the ideas, you know, those are embedded, making a difference, um, having conversations, you know, those are things like in, in the culture now, uh, nobody knows quite where they came from or, or why they're in the culture, but, you know, I think he knows, and that's the source of satisfaction for him. He should be credited with creating the discipline called transformation, which has made a profound impact on the lives of many, 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 many people. And those people have made a profound impact on the lives of many, many, many people. I remember Werner once said that what he wanted to put on his uh, tombstone was the words, used up. And I think he will be. There is no meaning to life. Life is meaningless, which is wonderful news because it's up to me to create the meaning in my life. And I can't think of anything more exciting. We have been born to find our way. What is the path that we will take? I quit smoking. I have a better relationship with my brother. I realized uh, how I had been uh, treating other folks in my life. Had no idea that I was hurting people. Not only being more self-confident, but the ability to take more risks and, and, and go for things that I wanted in life. Now my final words are really to um, acknowledge you for being willing to take a chance on that there's something great sitting in your seat. Because I think that takes an enormous amount of courage and compassion. And uh, it, it, uh, it uh, absolutely fulfills who I am to see you do that. That's, uh, that's as good as it gets for me.